It is because of the Lord's great love for us that we are not consumed. Great is your faithfulness. Your mercies are new every morning. Amen. Fellow believers in Christ Jesus, every now and then a word comes into the English language that makes me wonder, what took so long for it to be invented? One such word is hangry. Do you know what it means to be hangry? Maybe you're feeling a bit hangry right now. It's a combination of two words, hungry and angry. Couples should never start important decisions and discussions on an empty stomach. Parents should never think they can talk sense into their children unless the children are well fed with all sorts of snacks and treats. If not, they'll just end up being hangry with one another, and that conversation will go nowhere. In our sermon text this morning, the gospel lesson, which Nick shared with us a moment ago, a certain follower of Jesus had become hangry. Only her hanger, if that's a word, did not come from the fact that she hadn't eaten any food. It's because she was lacking the one needful, the word of God, which points to Jesus, the bread of life. And poor Martha, she just wanted to be the perfect host for Jesus. But she didn't realize that there was something more important than serving Jesus, and that is to be served by him. This Martha then was no Martha Stewart, polished and polite. I'm not in the habit of doing this, but I, I do want to assume the role of a woman this morning, if I may, to share this message with you from Martha's perspective. So this is a message from Martha, not Stewart. Don't get hangry like I did. Keep devouring the one thing needful. I'm not going to speak in a falsetto voice, so if you're waiting for that, you're going to be disappointed. But I am Martha. Your pastor just introduced me to you. I had a sister named Mary. I had a brother named Lazarus. We lived in the small town of Bethany, not too far away from Jerusalem, and we were followers of Jesus. On one occasion, towards the end of his ministry, Jesus sent word that he was going to visit my home. By this time, Jesus was quite famous. People flocked from all over the place to listen to him, and they brought their sick so that they might be healed by this Jesus. That Jesus was coming to my house. I wanted everything to be perfect for him. I hope that's how you feel about Jesus, too. He's done so much for us. He's opened the way to heaven by opening himself up to taunts and ridicule and even to death that we might have forgiveness. How can we ever think of treating Jesus as if he was nothing more than just a pet for whom leftovers will do? Sorry if it sounds as if I'm getting worked up. That was my problem on that day Jesus came to visit. I was so excited and I want, wanted everything to be so perfect that I locked myself in the kitchen. And I found that my flatbread was getting singed. My stew didn't have its usual zing, and I hadn't even started on dessert yet. What I needed was a helper. I had such a helper. And my sister Mary, but what was she doing? She was just sitting there at the feet of Jesus, listening to him talk, as if she had nothing better to do in the world. Of course, now I realize that there is nothing better in the world 
than to sit at the feet of Jesus and to listen. It's the one thing needful. It's a lesson that I had to learn the hard way, and it's a lesson that your God, God the Holy Spirit, wants you to learn this morning. Think again about what I was doing. I was serving Jesus. I was doing something that was good and God-pleasing. If I had been sinning, Jesus would have popped his head in the kitchen and would have said, Martha, put down that spoon and come here and sit next to Mary. He didn't say that, though. It's not like I was gossiping with a neighbor. It wasn't like I was tipping back more wine than I should have. I was doing something good. But this is how tricky Satan is. He takes the good things of this life And he can make them into curses. I was missing out on the one thing needful because I thought I was the host, when in reality Jesus had come to my house to be the host. He had come to serve me. He had come to remind me and Mary and my brother Lazarus what his mission was all about. He was just weeks away from dying on the cross. And yet most of us followers didn't fully grasp really what Jesus was up to. We thought maybe he was coming to Jerusalem because finally he would drive out the dreaded Romans. I mean, he had the power to do that. But he came to remind Mary, Martha, myself, and Lazarus, no, I'm coming to fulfill God's mission of saving the world, of dying on the cross to pay for sin. But because I wasn't there listening to Jesus, I became hangry. And I showed it in the way that I addressed Jesus. I came whipping out of the kitchen. I said, Jesus, don't you care about me? I'm slaving away for you, and my sister's just sitting there doing nothing. Tell Mary to help me. Yeah, makes me embarrassed just to have to repeat the words. Have you ever gotten upset with Jesus like that? Found yourself saying, Jesus, don't you care about me? Can you think back to a particular situation where maybe you've said that? Could it be that you aren't sitting at the feet of Jesus, listening to him? Could it be that you are busy doing something good? You are taking care of your family. You're driving the kids to soccer practice. You're staying late at work because someone has to take work seriously, and it's a good thing that You're one of those people. All good things, all can be done to the glory of God. But do you see what Satan does? He starts to make us think those are more important. And that making time, not just finding time, but making time for Jesus, that's unimportant. You see, what happens to us believers is we start to think of the words of Jesus as a treasure, a bar of gold. But what do you do with a bar of gold? You don't stick it in your pocket and walk around with it. It's too heavy. You don't leave it out on your doorstep for your neighbors to admire because it will be gone within 24 hours. A bar of gold you take and you lock away. Might that also happen in our lives as believers? We know how precious God's word is. And so we take it and we lock it away and we think, I'll get it out when I need it. But if that's the approach you'll take, you're going to become hangry because God's word is more like food. You need to keep devouring it to sustain you not just for the next life, for for what's going to come in this life, 
I needed to be listening to Jesus so that when he died on the cross, I would be ready. But that's not the only reason Jesus had stopped by my house. There was going to be another traumatic event in my life that Mary and I didn't know about yet. Remember I said I had a brother, Lazarus? Does that name ring any bells? Shortly after Jesus' visit, Lazarus became sick. Went from bad to worse. It's clear that he was dying, and so we sent word, Jesus, the one you love, your friend Lazarus is dying. Come quickly. By the time Jesus showed up, my brother had been dead for days. If I would not have taken any time that day when Jesus came to visit to listen to him, I would have been devastated, not just at the loss of my brother, but I think I would have accused Jesus of being a false messiah. Well, sure, Jesus, you can heal everyone else, but you can't heal your good friend Lazarus. You say that you love us, and yet you let our loved one die. I look back now, and I realize that Jesus had come to prepare us for that event so that I was able to go out and to meet Jesus. And I say, the one that you love has died, but I know that even now, God will do whatever you ask. And Jesus said, your brother will rise again. And I agreed, yeah, Jesus, I know. At the second coming at Judgment Day, he will rise again. But Jesus said, no, that's not what I'm talking about. Jesus went on to say, didn't I say if you believed, you would see marvelous things? And that's when I made a confession that I, I could hardly believe myself. I said, I believe that you are the Christ, the Son, of the Son of God, who has come into this world. I didn't make that confession because I was so smart. It's because what Jesus had taught me had worked faith, had strengthened faith, in my heart, that even at that desperate moment, I knew who the answer was to my problems, and that was Jesus. I didn't imagine what he did, though. He asked where Lazarus had been buried, and so we went to the cave-like tomb, and then Jesus asked for the stone to be rolled away. I said, Jesus... Lazarus has been dead for days. I'm not sure this is a good idea. It's my hostess kicking in. It's going to be a smell that I can't get rid of. Jesus persisted. And so we rolled the stone away, and that's when he looked up to the heavens, and then he looked back down as if into the tomb, and he said, Lazarus, to my dead brother, Lazarus, as if he could hear, Lazarus, come out. And my brother came out of the tomb very much alive. Jesus wasn't kidding when he had said moments earlier, I am the resurrection and the life. He who believes in me will live even though he dies. Have those words brought you comfort? They're not just words. They're rooted in reality. But if you're not re regularly sitting at the feet of Jesus, you might not be adequately prepared when those kind of difficulties and challenges come. I get it, you're busy. But can I just put things into perspective here? You guys have washing machines. I do not. You guys have dishwashers even if they're just your kids. I did not. You guys can go to the supermarket and get everything in one go. You turn a knob and water comes out. I had to go to the well every day. You think you're busy? I 
And I also understand when you're sitting at the feet of Jesus, listening to him, it seems as if nothing is getting done. I bet right now you're thinking of your to-do list, aren't you? Put it away. Put it away. We're listening to Jesus. And here's the thing. Listening to Jesus is like saying, okay, I'm going to get up a half hour early so I can get a good breakfast because you've got a big hike planned. Do you say that's a waste of time to spend the 30 minutes preparing and eating that breakfast? Of course not. Because if you skip that, how far do you get? into your hike before you realize that, oh, I can't go on. There is one thing needful, the Word of God. Friends, don't let all the other good things, being a good parent, being obedient children, being an honest, hardworking employee, all those things are good, but do not let them elbow out. The need, the need to keep hearing Jesus say to you, I am God, but I am your God. I am your Savior. And everything that I promise is true. I had a hard time understanding what Jesus meant when he said to me, Martha, Martha, you are distracted and upset by many things, but Mary has chosen what is better, and it will not be taken from her. What wouldn't be taken from my sister Mary? It's not like Jesus was handing out gold coins to reward her for listening. It goes back to this truth. God delights in working in our ways that are so unspectacular. Every other Sunday, you've got a middle-aged white guy of a pastor who stands before you and shares the word of God, and it'd be easy to think, that's it, that's, that's all I get. Wouldn't it be great if God himself came down? He does in his word and in the sacrament of Holy Communion. When Jesus said, Mary has chosen what is better, it will not be taken from her. What does God's word do? Creates faith, strengthens faith, and that's strengthening my hold on eternal life and also the courage I need to live in this life. No one, nothing can take that from you. But everything else that you can do as human the overtime that you work, the degrees that you earn, the nice hip clothes that you buy, the fast car that you drive, the big home in which you live. That will be taken from us one day, won't it? When Jesus returns in all his glory, everything will burn. What will be the point of all those things then? Don't get hangry like I did. You see, when you're apart from God's word, you start to take your anger out on the people around you, thinking that they're your slaves, instead of realizing that, no, I'm their servant. When you're apart from God's word, you forget that God is here to serve me. That's why I didn't get, I thought Jesus had come to my house so that I could serve him. It's the same reason you come to church. Why are you here this morning? So you can sing praises, you can offer prayers, so you can give money as an offering. All those are good things. But not the main reason you are here. You are here to be served by Jesus, just as it is in Holy Communion. What do you bring to Holy Communion? Oh, your sins? Your worries? And what does Jesus give in exchange? His body and his blood with the bread and wine. He reaches out and he puts an arm around you. He draws you close and he says, yes, all these treasures are for you. And no one, not even Satan, can take it away from you.
I believe there's a saying in your culture, it goes something like this. Don't just sit there, do something. I saw the gentleman over there, that young gentleman, he, he had a nice little smile because I think he's probably lived by that, he's sitting next to the woman there in pink. Uh, I think that's been his, his mantra his whole life, right? Don't just sit there, dude. I'm talking about Richard. I, I'm Martha. I can't know his name. Work with me here, people. But we live by that mantra, don't we? Jesus turns it around. He says, don't just do something. Sit there. Sit there and listen. Let me serve you. Amen.